Betts, Associates of Credit, Royce White. Um, he's going to be giving us some history on uh, some things he's been dab dab uh, dealing with with mental health. So I think it's some stuff we all can kind of learn, whether we're dealing with it or not. Um, but any questions that you guys may have, same thing every week. If you have a question you want to ask, just raise your hand. It's down in the chat. Put a hand up, and we'll come to you at the end in the last 15 minutes. If you have a question you want me to ask specifically, um, just put the question in the chat or Q&A box. And this is Sherry, Queen Sherry, if you want to be appropriate. Queen Sherry will definitely contact me <laughs> to let me know to ask that specific question. Other than that, I think we are going to have a great show today. I think uh, we're going to have, have a good time, man. I hope you guys got some good questions, man. I'm sure I do. All right. Share, are we ready? I am. Um, yep, I'm waiting for Arnie and then, um, which I think Arnie is about to join us in a second because he just texted me. Um, and then we're just, <clears throat> I think Royce is having some dial in issues. So I'm going to talk to him offline just to make sure he's good. Okay, okay. Yeah, we have, we've had that a couple times, uh, but let's do this. And uh, I just want to give everybody some history of who who Royce White is. So if you don't know, kind of give you some history on him. So we know he's an NBA player, but. Royce Alexander White, born April 10, 1991, is a former American professional basketball player. During his tenure in the NBA, White struggled with mental health issues, mainly generally anxiety, triggered by highly publicized fear of flying. As he's been an advocate for the National Basketball Association to expand their mental health policies, White has since embarked on a mixed martial arts career, beginning his training in 2018 and plans his first fight in 2020. Um, White was the 2009 Miss, uh, Minnesota Mr. Basketball and the two-time Minnesota State High School League champion, team member. He was a, cl a class three champion in 2006 with De La Salle High School as a freshman and a class 4A champion in 2009 with Hopkins High High School uh, as a senior, leading his school to a perfect 31 and 0 record. White played college basketball with Iowa State basketball team Starring for the 2011-2012 Cyclones, leading his team in every major uh, statistic, statistical category. Before that, he was a high school basketball star in the state of Minnesota, and he committed to play basketball in Minnesota. Uh, Golden. Okay, All right, we got him here. <laughs> the go, the Golden. Uh, Gophers, Gophers, men's basketball team before you before being suspended by the team and transferring to Iowa State. White was called a mystery pick of 2012 Chicago, I mean uh, NBA draft due to his NBA ready body, power for point four skill set and public disclosure of generalized anxiety disorder. Diagnosed during his season at Iowa State. White was drafted. In the first round by the Houston Rocket, Rockets. But today we have number 16. Uh, we have a, a former 16 round draft, first round draft pick, Mr. Royce White, my buddy, my man. Uh, we met this guy just to give you all the back. So we met this guy in Mississippi, uh, do a direct connect to Mush, also known as Tom, Thomas Gaston, our little brother. And, um, 
We've been connected ever since he came to see us and also gave us some tickets to the Big Three right now. We know he plays for the Big Three. Uh, he's the star there. So today, if you guys can welcome our brother. Man, we're we happy to see you, Royce. How you doing, man? Man, I'm good. I'm good, man. Uh, we just we just happy to have you on board. And uh, our good uh, host, Arnie Duncan, going to ask you the questions, man, because he's the, he the, he the, he the king of this stuff. I'm great, great. <laughs> All right, Arnie, take it away. Uh, I'm the war, war of act, and I'll turn it back to Ali to ask some more questions. <laughs> you get the hard ones for him and ask more ones for the guys. We're always so good to see you. How are you doing? I'm good, man. How are you doing? Good to meet good, you. Good, good. Really appreciate you taking the time. And just want to – we always just try and be real, real honest, honest, real, real with our guys and just really want them to – to learn, you know, what's worked, what hasn't, lessons learned, and you've had a pretty extraordinary life. And let's sort of, you know, I was just trying to walk through someone's bio a little bit. When did you really start to get serious about basketball? What age? Mm, that's a good question. Uh, serious? You know, I guess I was serious at an early age. Um, you know, I, I always really enjoyed the game. I enjoyed watching it. I enjoyed playing it. Um, I enjoyed playing it, um, you know, <laughs> on the video game even and, and I come from a sports background a sports family so you know I always took it serious I guess taking it serious and then um, realizing that you're better than other players and then and then starting to enjoy that probably came around uh, junior high junior high and your, your drives people can't see but just so our, our guys know how tall are they uh six eight and a half yeah 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 and going from junior high to high school, you had a tremendous amount of success in high school, went to a couple of different schools. How do you think about where to go to high school and why did you end up transferring? Yeah, so um, my high school choice was really based on my grandfather, who uh, is a Hall of Fame referee here in the Twin Cities. And, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, a, a sort of a legendary sports figure, you know, um, as, as a black man here in the Twin Cities. His name is Frank White. And because of his uh, past in sports here in the city and as a referee, he had, uh, you know, his his coaches that he liked, that he had refed and that, you know, he respected and probably had developed relationships with. Um, and Dave Thorson, who was the coach at De La Salle at the time, was highest on his list. He wanted me to play for Dave. Uh, and it was one of the best choices that, that we could have made. Dave taught me a lot that I took with me, um, you know, not only in basketball, but in life. So that was pretty much the, the basis of, of my high school choice. I really didn't even have any say. He kind of said De La Salle, and I, you know, I kind of went with that. Um, I ended up transferring because I had a situation where I uh, was cheating on a test with a teammate. And I was at a school that, you know, a private Catholic school, and they had a zero tolerance policy around cheating on tests. So, you know, they just missed me for academic misconduct. You know, that, that was a tough blow. I was my, my high school coach at the time had, you know, a pretty you know, father-son type relationship. Um, so, you know, that was a tough blow, but I ended up transferring to Hopkins High School, which was coached by another guy who my grandfather has known many years and respected, um, you know, Coach Novak Jr., whose dad actually, um, you know, is, is an, who, who him and his dad are other, you know, legendary historic Minnesota basketball figures, two Hall of Fame coaches. And so I had the, the honor and the, and the blessing and the fortune to be able to play for two Hall of Famers in my formative years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Talk about some of those, not just, we'll get back to basketball. What are some of those lessons you learned from those coaches about off the court? What did they instill in you? What were the life lessons you picked up that had nothing to do with putting the ball in the basket? Yeah. Um, you know, Dave Thorson, I think, he, he related things back to basketball often, um, but he also related things to you know, the military, some you'll hear a lot of sports coaches and basketball coaches uh, re relate things to military because of the team aspect and, and the fact that, you know, when you go to compete, you are in, in a battle of sorts and, and we're all in a battle of life of sorts. So, you know, Dave was was great at making those correlations. And, you know, something that always stuck with me from him was to be what they call a foxhole guy. 
right? And, and a guy, a foxhole guy is somebody who you can count on in, in what the military used to, you know, employ in, in battle tactics, you know, called the, the foxhole. And, you know, somebody who you can count on to, to be at your back, right? Uh, and, and to do what's necessary for the betterment of the team. Um, and I guess I kind of took that as, you know, being unselfish. And I, I did that as a player and I was able to go forward and do that uh, in life off the court as well. So um, Coach Novak, different different character, uh, just as brilliant, um, taught me a lot more about being patient. You know, that was what he had to kind of do for me is uh, try and temper down my, my uh, aggression and flair and the, the need for that competition, the need to dominate. Uh, he he kind of he, he enjoyed it, and it, it was beneficial to him as well. And the team we went thirty one and zero, which is still a record that hasn't been that hasn't been broken yet here in the Twin Cities. But in terms of of his personal contribution to me, it was definitely along the lines of, of being more patient and more uh, thoughtful. And I'm sure that, you know those NBA dreams probably started early, and we'll get to that part of the chat part of the story, but. How did you balance the, the basketball part with the academic part going through school? Yeah, I didn't do a great job with it early on, I'll tell you that. Um, you know, that's that's part of, I guess, what they don't tell you. I, I came in a different era, too. I think, you know, basketball, sports, um, and the, the whole student-athlete concept has uh, went underwent major transformation even in the last, you know, five years, ten years. Um, 12 years ago now when I was in my prime high school years, so freshman, sophomore, junior, um, there was still very heavy uh, expectations on, on athletes in, on the scholastic side, right? Uh, I think now we better understand that a lot of the pressure and a lot of the, the physical ask from athletes does kind of meet the, the requirement of, of a real job. Right. And so, you know, teachers are a little bit more accommodating. School systems are a little bit more accommodating. Colleges are becoming more accommodating to athletes in terms of, you know, figuring out how to best manage their workload on the scholastic side. Um, but for me back then, it, it wasn't that way. And plus, I went to, a, 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 you know, a very, a very traditional, uh, historical private Catholic high school. So yeah, they definitely weren't giving us any breaks. And so, you know, I had like a 2.0, 2.1, uh, and it wasn't easy, you know, because we weren't given any any reprieves on assignments or given extended time because we practiced at 6 a.m. 72 times a year, you know, for the boys' basketball. So, yeah, I mean, it was tough at first. When I got to Hopkins, you know, I changed uh, curriculums where we had, you know, four classes in the day versus eight. Um, so we had a much lighter load in general. Um, and then, you know, the public school setting and the, the public school support system was a, a bit different than the private school. Um, and then also, you know, I was able to be diagnosed with anxiety disorder uh, around 16, 17. So going into my new school, we had that information to be able to help me uh, with my academics as well. Minneapolis is an interesting place. It's home for you. It's not a place I know well. I've visited a few times and, you know, looking from the outside, it looks so, you know, everyone's nice and it's calm and it's peaceful and all that. But underneath that, I have, you know, a lot of good friends there and the, the racial dynamics of, of uh, the reality of living there is very different maybe than what you see on the surface. And, you know, what happened to George Floyd is not the first or the last time that something like that has happened. So just as a young black man, black family growing up in Minneapolis, what was that experience like? Yeah, so I mean, I recently, I'm actually finishing up a letter to Governor Waltz right now regarding the, the George Floyd situation and just the state of things racially here uh, in the Twin Cities in the aftermath of, of his murder and, you know, just reflecting on, you know, being one of the lead organizers of the protests here in the Twin Cities in the aftermath of George Floyd. Um, and just, you know, as I was reflecting, it kind of dawned on me that when I was growing up, it was advantageous for me to uh, adopt and sort of promote the diversity of the Twin Cities. And this is a very diverse place. I mean, we have the number one Somali immigrant community. We have the number one Hmong immigrant community. So I grew up in, in schools and in elementary and in junior high where there were just as many Somali and Hmong kids as there were black or white. Um, and, you know, I myself have a, a rich uh, 
you know, Mexican heritage in my own family. And there is a very, you know, big Mexican community here in the Twin Cities. So, yeah, we, we do have diversity. But I say in my letter to Governor Walz that um, I, I may have been bearing false witness when I was talking about diversity and promoting it because there's a difference between diversity on paper and diversity in spirit. And so I think what Minnesota has always gotten by on is the diversity on paper. Um, and, and the diversity in spirit is something that we've had problems with, obviously, and it, it, you know, came to surface in situations like George Floyd's, but has been there underneath the surface and, and other less notable uh, cop civilian situations in, in throughout this, this city's and this state's history. So, um, you know, I think that we have a long ways to go here in the Twin Cities as we do around the country. Uh, uniquely here in the Twin Cities, we we do have a, a veil of that I think is somewhat missing. I'm sorry, I broke up a little bit at the end. Just tell George Floyd's murder, what did that make you feel personally? Um, I, you know, for me, like, you know, Stephen Jackson, who's like a brother uh, of George Floyd, you know, they, they look very similar. Um, me and him have a, a personal relationship, a co-working relationship uh, that we developed in, when I was playing in the big three. Um, and so my first, you know, order of business with learning about George Floyd's death was to contact him. Because I knew he'd be on his way to town to deal with whatever it was needed to be dealt with in terms of George Floyd's, whether it's his funeral arrangements or family or whatever the case may be. Um, and, you know, for me personally, I was going to meet him when he arrived here and I was going to be with him until he decided to leave and whatever he wanted to do. Um, and so that was my, that was my initial thought process. Um, as far as the situation goes with George Floyd, um, I, I've kind of always been involved in the, the cop civilian conversation, at least uh, in the Black Lives Matter era, you could say. Um, I wrote a piece called I Can't Breathe Either at, in, in uh, the aftermath of Mike Brown's murder. Uh, and I talked about the militarization of the police. I talked about being a black man. I talked about the correlation and, and the sort of uh, symbolic correlation between a guy like myself who has anxiety and having to hear somebody say that they can't breathe and actually knowing what that feels like to not be able to breathe. Um, and then also just talking about the fact that mental health was a huge component that, that underpinned a lot of these issues, right? These cop civilian issues. Um, obviously, mental health is a huge issue for the black community, but it's also a huge issue for the cop community. Um, you know, police officers have one of the highest profession suicide rates in the country, all abuse, right, and domestic violence as well. So, you know, I kind of see it from that mental health. Help for me. What, what what took place and what I saw spill over more has to do with the 30,000 foot view of, of people and, and just where these entities are lying, you know, lie out there in real time. Like, you know, we have the people, we have citizens, and then we have the state, you know, and you're familiar with the state. And, and as I went out there to lead these protests, I tried to talk to the people, um, especially the black community along those lines, along those more philosophical political lines because I think a lot of times people want to talk over the, over the head of black people or they think they're talking over the head so they talk down to black people and um, I think you know we need to get past that and the reality is like the state has a monopoly on violence right you know it I know it we all know it there's a monopoly on violence and and any time you have a monopoly on violence that goes on uh, for us, you know you're going to have great tragedy like that you're going to have tyranny pop up you know and, and so that's what that's what you saw with George Floyd so obviously it just made me pretty angry um, but it also motivated me because it's like there was something in me that said that this level of tyranny is not something that couldn't befall me or my son or anybody else who who I care about or anybody else in general really it just seemed like an unacceptable uh, um, circumstance and what was your relationship with the police when you were a young man, when you were a teenager? And what did your parents talk to you about how to handle situations with the police? Yeah, I, I guess it never really came up. I mean, you get you get that 
those lessons more from being out in the streets, you know, um, and, and just being a young black kid who goes and plays ball at the park, who hangs out in the neighborhood, who, you know, um, has family members who, who spend a lot of time out in the streets. And, you know, you, you go to school and you get that education there. I don't really even remember a time where my mother or, you know, my, my, my grandfather or my aunts and uncles had any real uh, specific talks or dialogues with me about how to handle myself with the police. Um, I do know that there was kind of an unspoken culture that, that us as black folks were afraid of the police, you know, and, and there are those stories that, that you hear that you're told where people are mistreated by the police. Um, and, it, it, and it doesn't go unnoticed that, you know, you know, you grow up in a place where people are actually breaking the law too. I mean, that's not, it's not something that you can just overlook or say isn't happening. Uh, but, you know, we, we also understand that the state's in a position to, you know, to, to exact that, that monopoly at any given time, whether you're breaking the law or not. And I guess that, that kind of went unspoken, which is, which is actually pretty sad and, and telling of where things are in this country that you could not even have any real conversations about it explicitly, but still kind of just emotionally know that the state can run amok over you as a citizen, right? And to be a leader in that, you know, in that movement there, in those protests, what did you learn? What did that feel like? What did you experience? And, how, you know, what's the state of things now in your city? You know, it's, 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 a, it's a wild time, man. I think, you know, the political, the political landscape in this country is so fractionated. It's so fragmented. And, um, the black man and the black man's plight and black folks plight, the black community in this country has a very, very old, old um, history, you know, with, with what we're up against. And I think it's hard for people to keep that in mind. I think something gets so old and so talked about that people lose sight of just how, um, how much of a priority it needs to be. And I say that only to say, you know, from being on the ground level here as an organizer, I see that a lot of other movements have tried to sort of co-opt the black man's struggle. And, and in doing so, they're even willing to themselves attack black men, right? And, and so that, that's kind of been one of the troubling things that I've seen. It was uh, deep, yeah. You know, I, I, and then, so, it, you know, it, it was kind of a shocker, too, because I've kind of been this nomad in this advocacy space. I've been a nomad where I was the, the small guy who was considered weird or, or, you know, kind of strange or eclectic because I, you know, talk about the NBA as being a part of this global corporatocracy, right? And, and I use all of these words that people are like, what, what does that even mean? And, and so I've kind of been a nomad, but to go out there in the response to George Floyd and actually organize tens of thousands of people to march brought me into a space that I wasn't really in before. So it allowed me to hear voices and people talk about these black issues that I paid attention to but for the most part stayed out of on the boots on the ground, um, you know, level. Um, and there's just some strange characters out there, man. You know, and I think, you know, and, and you know, I mean, you, you, you know, you've been in the political world, you know, you, you know, your whole life. So you, you know what I mean? But a lot of these, a lot of these agendas, a lot of these people, a lot of these arguments lack coherency. And so what I tried to bring was a coherency uh, for, for our people here on the ground and hopefully spark a movement that spreads wide and far to bring a coherency to this, this struggle. And I think, you know, this is what I've been saying to people is that uh, uh, aside from Native Americans, obviously black people are America's oldest sin. As long as that sin stays unreconciled, the, the, the pursuit of a truly democratized country or the pursuit of, of freedom and happiness and, and justice and, and trying to uphold those things are always gonna be undermined. And um, that's why it's actually proper for the black man, the right black man, the, the right black leader to spring up and try and, and, and actually clarify these things and, and lead uh, this country into a new place. With all these other movements, that's fine. But make no mistake about it, black men should be at the forefront of that, right? Uh, or black people, at least, I will say. Um, but certainly black men should be, should be right there. And, and I don't see that on the ground level, people are really accepting of that. They're accepting that George Floyd being murdered was, was an atrocity, 
But I don't think that they're all the way accepting that a black man actually is the rightful person to come up and lead lead the counter movement. Um, and then I think that that's what needs to happen. And, and I'm trying to step in and, and take that uh, take one of those roles and encourage my other you know young black males uh, and black leaders across the country to do the same. You know, this is really deep. And uh, I'm going to come back to your personal story, but just a, a question there. You know, the murder of George Floyd, you, you just said it perfectly, was an atrocity. And that's 100% accurate. And it was, you know, it's not a whatever. It was, it was a murder. There's no, there's no other way. You can't sh sugarcoat that. The question that I actually, I struggle with a little bit is as much as we have to protest that, as much as we have to take to the streets, the reality, probably in Minneapolis, definitely in Chicago, is that while a police abuse is real and has been real for decades. If you look every single day at the number of black men who are dying here due to violence, you know, a tiny, tiny percent would be at the hands of police. And of 98, 99% are dying at the hands of other black men. Of course. And I, I've struggled with the Black Lives Matter movement, many of whom are friends, not being willing, or my perceptions not being willing to step into this space. And for me, violence is violence, whether it's perpetuated by the state, by the police, whether it's perpetuated by you know, folks on the street, you know, men of color, whatever. And the absence of that similar outrage, anger, us coming together, that somehow this, this violence that is the vast majority in Chicago that's destroying our communities um, the police are a part of the problem and maybe a significant prop, but they are not, if you just look at the raw numbers, the data, yeah. the vast majority of deaths are not happening at the hands of police. I'm mean, not even close. Well, yeah, no, so how, I, do you, how do you reconcile these two? Yeah, yeah, that's an important topic. And I think it's the one that, that has the country split right now, especially along the political lines and, and, and in our political debates. For me, um, I, I, I see it, a, a little bit differently. I, I definitely agree that the black on black crime is a, a, a extremely huge problem. Now, growing up in a black community, I also understand what a lot of it stems from. So I think that people who sometimes point to black on black crime are are wholly unwilling to address the systemic issues that lead to black on black crime. They they kind of talk we, about we black that situation. Yeah. They kind of talk about black on black crime in a vacuum, you know, like yeah. it's just the thing that just happens and, and the black people are to blame. But but that's not the whole story. Right. And, and so it's not to give anybody an excuse to roll to somebody else's neighborhood, roll down a window and kill them. But uh, there there's also other conversations and other details that need to be discussed when talking about black on black crime to paint a proper picture, especially if we're talking about solutions. Um, but but I do view violence from the state is different and and so my the way for me to to parse the two out is that it, it for me I can't in good faith say that I expect from a young lost soul on the streets of Chicago on the streets of Minneapolis to uphold the same virtues honors respect code of ethics that I would a police officer right and and so the mental health piece actually does humanize people it creates that common denominator but not to the standard when, once we start to arm people, right? Once we start to arm people, and this is why I've always tried to bring us back to the mental health debate, because I think the right wing of this country, the conservative, the more conservative talking point of this country wants to have a, a conversation about gun rights. And then they also want to have a conversation about mental health checks as proper gun control, right? But the reality is most of them don't realize by any uh, mental health or, or, or psychological criteria that we have today most of them wouldn't be fit to have guns anyway right and so these are the details and the nuances that really start to like obscure some of these talking points and so for me it's just listen if you get a badge from the state if you will the authority of the state you are on a much different level than your local black kid who joins a gang at 15 for protection for belonging for money for food for uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, identity, whatever the case may be, you're on a different level. And as soon as we start to draw back from delineating those two people from each other, we kind of give the cops free reign to shoot black folks again, because it's, it's kind of to say, well, well, black people are shooting black people. So why can't I, or, or we already know they're violent. So, so why wouldn't you believe that I was really afraid for my life? And, and so, you know, in the George Floyd situation, particularly, 
you guys weren't afraid for your life. We know that. And there's too many times where you get to say, because black people are violent on paper, it justifies it to maybe other white decision makers, whether it be in federal courts, Supreme courts, uh, state courts, state legislators, or whoever the case, whoever that may be, it starts to justify this use of lethal force. And it's not only in post, it's in pre, right? The way that they're actually trained assumes that lethal force will always, is, is always on the table, yeah. right? And for me, a country and, it, and its state should be the example of who they want their people to be, right? And so if lethal force is always an option for the state, then why wouldn't it be for its people, right? And, and why would the people be quicker to do, quicker to that lethal force? Because we don't, we don't abide by the same honor codes, right? The street is sort of a, an every man for himself. It's a survival of the fittest. And, and, and intentionally so, I might add, right? It was kind of America's way to, to create a survival of the fittest, kill or be killed mentality, right? And, and even at the corporate level, we do it in the corporate world too. And we think that, you know, those moral, morals and ethics don't seep into our communities. But, but the way that people build their emotional and psychological complexes are based on the ethics that we uphold in very small rooms and very, very insignificant or seemingly ins insignificant times. So yeah, black on black crime is an issue. Young black men shouldn't shoot each other. Based on our history alone, we should have more unity. We should have more respect for each other's lives. We should have more um, love. You know, we should have less of this machismo against each other where it's I'm tougher than you or you disrespect me. So now in order to prove that I deserve respect, I have to kill you. Those things are all right. Nobody with a sane mind would argue that. Um, the same people who are part of the state are also involved in, in, a, in a systemic culture that doesn't actually let us get those messages to those people. And, and my greatest example, I would say, is a guy like Malcolm X, right? Who the state, whether they killed him or not, they wanted him dead. Yeah. And there's too many black leaders like that who actually did preach that black folks should clean up their act. Don't drink. Don't be out past midnight. Don't be cheating on your, your wife or, or, you know, or don't be, you know, going back on, on your, your commitments, right? Uh, don't, don't draw arms against another black man or against another Muslim man, right? And, and Minister Farrakhan is still there in Chicago preaching many of these same things. And the state has demonized them. So it's hard for me to hear that the black on black crime issue from the state because they've played such an active role in, in, in stopping our messengers from getting that word widespread. So that's kind of where I'm at on it. You know, it's real deep, and it's probably even deeper than that. It's not just stopping the messages. There's maybe some self-interest in perpetuating that, you know, that, that crime. You know, it justifies a lot of different things. So it's not, it's not necessarily seen as a bad thing by everybody. Um, right. Growing up as an athlete, like you, you know, I was trying to work out all the time, trying to eat right, you know, work out two, three times a day, take care of your body. Knew a lot about physical health. I don't remember anyone ever having a conversation with me about mental health. Um, I don't remember the first time I even heard that term. I don't know when that was. When did you sort of first start to understand that you were struggling and had some, some challenges there that not everybody had? At what age, what, what age did you have that realization and what was that like to, to feel that? Yeah, I shared this with the Chicago Prairie guys when I was down there. I, um, <clears throat> I had a situation in high school where I was smoking marijuana with some friends at a cabin. You know, we live in Lake Country, so... <clears throat> you know, not, not like the concrete jungle that, that, that you guys are blessed with in Chicago. Uh, we, we still go out to the woods and to the lakes and, you know, and we come back to the neighborhood after that, right? So I was blessed to be able to have that, that kind of balance. But anyway, um, me and some of my friends were smoking marijuana at a cabin where his family had left for the weekend, and I had a massive panic attack. Um, and it's just one of normal, you know, I smoked a little weed. I'm, I'm, I'm a little paranoid. This was like out-of-body experience, shaking, throwing up, you know, really believed I was going to die, right, and, and really felt like I was dying, um, <clears throat> and I didn't know what it was, you know, I called the nurse's hotline that night to, to try and get some frame of reference of if I really was going to die or not, um, it's, it's kind of funny now that I look back that I even called the nurse line instead of just rushing into the ER, because so many times since then, I've had panic attacks with anxiety, and i I go to the ER, I've been to the ER so many times. At that point, I was even scared to go to the emergency room, right? So, uh, but she was the first, the nurse in the hotline was the first one who said, I think you may have had a panic attack, right? Now, this was before smartphones and, 
and and you could just Google anything, right? And that seems like a shock, but just 12 years ago, we didn't have smartphones where you could just access the internet and Google the latest word that you you, you heard. Um, so it really wasn't for another like three months after suffering through massive, massive panic attacks that I uh, met a doctor who explained to me exactly what panic attacks were, what anxiety disorder was, and then what mental health was. So right around 16 was the time and it, it came because of my own struggles with, with anxiety and panic attacks. And I'm sure you saw this week, you know, Michelle Obama come out and talk about mental health and struggling during this time with, with depression. And as you know, mental health is a hard thing to talk about anywhere. It's often stigmatized. It's tougher in the black community. It's probably, you know, maybe toughest among black men who, as you say, have to appear so mantra for so many reasons to sort of say, I'm struggling with whether it's anxiety, whether it's with a lifelong trauma, um, whatever it might be. Um, were you able to articulate this to others? Was it something you were ashamed of and kept to yourself? Could you talk about it? What did it do to your sort of sense of self-esteem and who you were as a young man? Yeah, I mean, I was, I was fortunate in that regard, you know, and I go speak all the time to schools and communities and corporations about mental health. And I always make sure to stress that I was fortunate in this regard. I was fortunate to be the best athlete already. I was fortunate enough to have a brand. I was fortunate enough to, to, to be, you know, uh, the, the jock at the school, but also intelligent, right? Also articulate. Um, I was a leader. I had my own lunch table. And I always tell people that I, I, I sat at the lunch table, people sat with me, you know? And so there wasn't really anything that I could say um, around like anxiety or depression or any of those things that I was struggling with that would alienate me from my friends, right? Or that would have them laugh at me or try and, you know, bully me. I'm 6'8", 260, you know, I, it's hard for somebody to bully me regardless <laughs> of what they think, right? So I didn't have to deal with that, but there are a lot of people who do. So I always want to be mindful and explain to people like, man, it, it's not always safe to talk about anxiety. For me, it was, it was safe. And the people around me were receptive. They were accepting. I was able to teach a lot of them. They were curious. They started to find out and get diagnosed because I was so open about it. And um, be, because of my own just personality and being forward and, and, and outgoing, um, it, it did something special for me. It actually unlocked this pathway for me to be able to help other people get diagnosed and talk about mental health. So I had a completely unique um, you know, uh, relationship with, with that identity of having a mental health issue than I think a lot of other black men but a lot of other people in the world in general. So um, I do think that, you know, what I try to tell people now is uh, in, in regards to black men, but just young men in general, I think, I think we get confused using the mental health terms that are technical with asking for help in ways that are in their language, right? So I try to stress that to schools because, you know, they say some of the same things like, uh, we have trouble with our young boys and getting them to want to talk about these issues or getting us to tell, tell, getting them to tell us they're struggling. And I go, wait a minute. They're telling you they're struggling. They're just not saying anxiety. They're just not saying depression. They're just not saying PTSD. They're just not saying claustrophobia. They're not saying eating disorders. They're not saying identity crisis, right? Because they don't have those words to use. But when people act out, what they're acting out is untreated mental health issues, right? And so to take it all the way back to the police, I think, I think our justice system could take a page out of that book, right? It's, if, I, if I am at, at, in class and, and, and I ask to go to, the, to you know, get something to drink from the cafe, because maybe I didn't eat this morning, maybe I haven't eaten for the last three days, right? Because my family doesn't have the money or we're going through a hard time. You know, and the teacher goes, well, no, you can't go do that right now. And I go, oh, F you, right? Is it right away to say that I'm a bad person or a bad kid, or is it to investigate and really figure out why I'm at that level of irritability on that day? And is it to assume that, like, that irritability is really coming from a character flaw, or is it actually something that I'm dealing with that's, that's maybe more, uh, more complex? And then if it is, how do we actually start to address that? And I think I was fortunate enough to go to a high school where that's the approach they took, right? So once again, I was fortunate. And I was able to, to, to move forward in the world with a perspective that let me know, hey, a lot of times people are going through issues and their interaction with people isn't based on, you know, an inherent want to harm or an inherent want to, to hurt. It's just, you know, a, a set of circumstance. 
So fast forward, you go to Iowa State, you have this amazing career. It's not that you're, you know, six eight and two sixty, you're unbelievably talented, you're a leader, lead the team in all kinds of categories, stuff I could only have dreamed about. And, you know, out of whatever number of, you know, hundreds of thousands of kids that started playing high school basketball as a freshman, eight years later, you're a first round draft choice, 16th pick. So you're the top 20 players in the world in your class, top 20 in the world. You've, you've lived a dream that so many of us, you know, would love to have lived and we didn't have that, you know, those skills or ability. What happens at that point though? So from the outside, it looks like you are living the dream. Your, 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 whole, your whole life purpose is about to be fulfilled here. What happens at that point? Man, I mean, that's, 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 a, that's an hour, two hour, three hour, <laughs> five day movie series booking of itself, but you it's know, coming. Uh, give, give, me the, give me the preview. <laughs> yeah, I'll give you the, the cliff notes. You know, all in all, what happened was I came into the NBA culture and community um, with this knowledge of mental health, right? With, with a, an evolving understanding of the mental health crisis at work in our society. And I tried to, I tried to not only be very transparent and public about my views on mental health, but I really try to challenge the system to, to walk forward into, into the room with these, with these views that, that aren't, they're not debatable really, right? Like, you know, I tried to say to the NBA, look, we have policies on everything regarding these players, you know, down to what socks they should and shouldn't wear. And, and you know, or we have a banned substance list with psycho, you know, psychotherapeutic drugs on it, yet we have no mental health policy. I have a problem with that. Um, and and it's, it's not a problem that doesn't have a solution. Now, their response to me was, was sort of, well, how dare you even bring up that we're not doing something right? Mm -hmm. Right. You know, mm. who are you to who are you to question us? And there there's something deeply racial in that. And, you know, if you look at the power structure of the NBA or professional sports or the entertainment industry or the corporatocracy as a whole, what they were really saying is what makes this young black kid think that he's any more competent than we are? Well, right? What does he have, right now, what does he have to teach as us? History will tell it. I wasn't right. Right. And, and, and as history would tell it, will tell it, I was more competent than they were. Mental health was a crisis, not only in our society, but it was a crisis, especially in the NBA. Right. And six years later, as Kevin Love and DeMar DeRozan and those guys started to come forward, you had other people in the NBA community say things like this is an epidemic in our in our community. This is, you know, players are are struggling with this all throughout our league in, in a way that we're not addressing. So, you know, I was kind of the first one to raise that alarm. You know, I got chastised for it. I got mocked for it. I got blackballed for it. Um, and and that's, the, uh, that's the common plight of people who are actually making meaningful change. So, you know, that, that's, kind of, that's kind of what happened as I was drafted. I, was, I went lower in the draft than I should have because mental health had a stigma to it. Um, and, and, then I, and then I found myself out of the league in short order because – you know, mental health had a stigma to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And my list is fascinating. I could talk for hours. I'll, I, this is my last question. I'll turn it over to Ali to open up to our guys. But our young men, our young women, our staff, folks that may be struggling with, with PTSD or struggling with you know, trauma now or struggling with depression or anxiety or whatever it might be, what be your advice to, to you know, those of us on this call from your lived experience? What's your advice to, to any of us that are, that are thinking about these things in very personal ways? That's tough, man. I think I think advice, you know, around mental health, this is a, an issue that does have, you know, that is a common denominator for people, but it is very individualistic. Um, obviously, go and seek help, you know, is it, something it's, it's that you shouldn't be ashamed to do. I think more and more I'm starting to understand how hard it really is to get that help. And right. And I, and I think, again, this goes back to my comment about the state, you know, not to circle back and continue to beat the state down, but, but I'm going to continue to beat the state down for a second. Um, we've done an abysmal job with making mental health resources available to people. And, and especially given the society we've created, the, the culture and the society that we've created, the, 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 um, the decent thing to do, the fiduciary thing to do would be to create a universal mental health care system that's adequate, just based on the culture we've created in this country alone. 
right? And so I think, you know, for me, that's kind of what I'm seeing so far as, of course, I would tell people if they can go seek help. Now, I'm also not going to say that all the help that you may receive or seek is competent, is adequate, right? And that's kind of the, the issue that we faced is, you know, the resources that people have set up that are free, you know, let's just call it what it is, you know, free resources for mental health aren't always the, the best people, right? And, and it sucks to say that because I don't want to discourage people from going to get free help if they need it. But, you know, we have to understand that and start to address that as well. Um, and, you know, a, a huge thing I would say as a self-help tool for people struggling with mental health issues is to be honest, right? That's kind of the fail-safe way, in my opinion, to really, to really do some work for mental health. Be honest, right? That's going to go a long way because, you know, when, when, we're, when we're not honest, we create so many other layers of stress and, and, and you know, lies that we have to uphold. And there's enough chaos and, and, and hurt and pain in our lives anyway without adding our own, right? You'll, if you go through life completely honest, you'll have a tough time as it is, right? So if, if, you, if you be honest, if, you're, if you uphold honesty in your life, that's a great self-help tool for mental health. And, and people talk about anxiety, the same. And so and, and I can give you an example in my own life. If I had tried to go as a professional athlete or, or as a young elite athlete even, and lie about having anxiety because what Roy Williams may think or what Tubby Smith may think or what Jim Beheim may think, I would have died. Mm. I wouldn't have survived it, right? I wouldn't have survived trying to hide the fact that I had anxiety for somebody else's uh, approval. And so we also have to talk about self-validation and self-sufficiency uh, and self-love. And, and uh, you know, and that's something that we are struggling with in the Black community, I think. But, you know, you don't need everybody's approval. Right. Matter of fact, you don't you only need one person to prove that's God. When push comes to shove, your mom and dad, maybe some people in their case, not even so much. You need one person to prove well, that's the man upstairs. Um, and I guess I've always had that intuition and it's allowed me to be able to have anxiety and walk through that path with honesty. And it's been a great tool for me and one that I would pass along to anybody. Be honest. If you're dealing with shit, be honest with yourself, be honest with others, you know, and, and continue to walk forward. Um, you know, with, with strength and courage for yourself. Yeah, I'll turn over to Ali, just say, I appreciate your wisdom, your honesty, your strength, your vulnerability, your insight so much. So thank you so much. Ali, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, thank you, Arnie. Thanks. Thanks, Arnie, man. I'm, 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 I'm in awe, man, because uh, you dropping some real jewels that uh, I've heard previously from you, but it's like just, uh, I thought it was going to be more of the same, but it's like more of the same, but more in depth. So, man, I'm, I'm really taking this all in. Uh, we have a brother, uh, uh, Markham, Markham Turner. Markham Turner has a question he wanna ask. Markham, you're on mute. Okay, Markham. All right, so until we get him up there, we got a question uh, from Tim. He says, how did it make you feel when he was saying, uh, talking about George Floyd, when he was, saying he couldn't breathe how, how did that person make you feel yeah man i mean that that one hits home because for somebody with anxiety disorder you know one of the common symptoms is that feeling of suffocation like you can't breathe your chest getting tight um you know it was just hard to watch you know for me you know i'm a mixed martial artist i think self-defense i think you know uh hand-to-hand -hand combat and things like that um, so for me, it was hard for me to watch it and not just imagine myself um, hurting that cop, hurting Derek Chauvin, you know, um, if I was there. And so, you know, I guess my anger was first with him, but then my anger started to be with the people who were watching, too, on the street who were video recording. And we, we've walked into a society now where, you know, that monopoly on violence has people so afraid to, to intercede with the state is like, you know, don't record me getting killed. Get this cop off of me, right? And I think, you know, our black communities have to have to take that up right away, right? And so, you know, that's where I was personally when I was watching. I'm like, man, we got to start to create a culture where black folks, you know, band together, and not to say I'm going to go kill this cop because that wouldn't that wouldn't fit the that wouldn't fit, you know, not now post you 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 know that that's a different story because he actually did kill George Floyd. 
But in real time, as it was happening, I'm not going to let somebody choke somebody out for nine minutes. You're only going to get 60 seconds out of us before we come and remove you. And if you want to arrest us from, for stopping you from killing the next guy, then that has to be a rightful sacrifice we're willing to make. And if you're willing to kill more of us because we want to stop you from killing one of us unjustly, then that's a rightful sacrifice that we have to be willing to make. Right. And so that's where I was at with it. When I watched the video, those things spun through my mind right away. We have a question, a question from the brother, man, that you just, once again, you blowing it like my, I'm really taking all of what you're saying in. Uh, and we got a question from the brother Freddie on another topic. He's saying, uh, what's one thing you had to fix in order to obtain the success you've gotten? One thing I had to fix? One thing you had to fix or kind of straighten, I guess he said fix. Yeah, I mean, I've had to fix a lot of things. Um, too too many to count. I guess the 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 biggest issue for me as somebody who had anxiety and didn't realize it, um, I didn't realize how how the impatience in me was actually taking a physical toll on me, right? Um, so you know, and it wasn't just around basketball. Like I, I noticed it when I was young. I used to have these games, and I was so excited or anxious to go and play that by the time I had actually got to the game I was dog tired because I didn't sleep and you know I, I just had that young kids anxiety type of thing but I started to realize as I got older it was in other parts of my life as well like when I wanted something the, the lack of patience to getting it caused me to do things that that weren't wise they weren't smart things to do you know now they weren't criminal or they weren't you know, um, things that, that, that were fatal decisions, but they just weren't the best and they didn't help maintain the relationships that I had in my life, um, you know, as a young person. And, and even, even, you know, until recently, 23, 24, I'm still working on that. Right. Um, so, you know, that's kind of one of the things I had to try and tame is, you know, being patient, even though I do have this condition of anxiety that makes me naturally anxious. So I have to even try harder to be patient, which is like, you know, for people who have anger issues. If you know you got an anger issue, you have to make that much more of an effort to check your anger, right? Um, and, and so that's, for me, I had to I had to really work against something that naturally is against me in, in our society. I'm impatient. Okay, uh, man, thank you for that, that answer. Another question is, in the NBA, uh, do you think they, they've made some strides to help some of the uh, future uh, athletes with mental health issues nope wow plain and plain and simple i think i think we can look at the nba and see how uh, corporate america is very good at giving us solutions that are fruitless that really aren't meaningful they they do it for you know we have a we have a crazy pr culture in this country right and, and there are people that are very, very good at understanding what needs to be done to put out PR fires. But it, that, that's not the same as solutions. So, for example, remember when I said being honest was, was my tool and my advice to people for, for anxiety? Okay, so let's apply that to the NBA. What the NBA should come out and say in regards to mental health is we have a very immoral and unethical relationship with the alcohol industry. Our contribution to the culture of alcohol is abhorrent. We use tax dollars to build parking arenas next to basketball arenas. I mean, yeah, parking structures next to basketball arenas where you could come and get drunk in front of your kids, somebody else's, go get in the car and drive home under the influence, right? That's part of our business. We can't really change it, but we understand that it's a problem and we're working on trying to fix it. See, that honesty, would actually be them doing something about the mental health issue. Until they do that, you know, banning OJ Mayo for two years because he's on, you know, because he's doing illicit drugs is not addressing mental health. That's downstream. We have to start being more proactive, right? So my answer is no. And, and for them to, you know, call their, their buddies over at ESPN and say, yeah, you know, give Kevin Love the Arthur Ashe Award for mental health. 
that actually takes us in the opposite direction of doing something meaningful for mental health because now you're whitewashing it. And how dare you whitewash an issue that other black people have spoken out on and give, and give this guy a black man's award. Arthur Ashe, of all people, too, who was like one of the most sacrificing black athletic leaders in our history, right? And so, no, they haven't. I mean, they've, they've done a lot of talking. They've done a lot of posturing. They've done a lot to, to try and, um, you know, put out a PR fire because mental health was something I brought up and they got caught with their pants down. And, and they've, they've, they've pulled their pants back up, but they definitely haven't dealt with any issues as it pertains to their structure and, and their attitude towards mental health. Um, you know, would you suggest that in schools, some of the high schools or even grammar schools, that they should have some some kind of classes or courses of people set to the side to address mental health? Uh, and what some of those suggestions you would have for for them? What, I mean, I don't know if you've thought about this before. Yeah, yeah. No, I think I think we should. You know, I think we should. Um, really go back to the drawing board with our education and reimagine what education looks like with, with the knowledge that we have about the mental health crisis. Uh, I don't see how, I don't see how any school puts together a curriculum uh, at, at this point without concerted effort to integrate mental health awareness and, and education into that and emotional stability or, you know, a lot of, a lot of these children, a lot of these young people, especially at the high school level, are, are not able to actually capitalize on what they're being offered in their curriculum because they're dealing with all these underlying mental health issues. And it's only getting worse. And it's only at a point where the drug abuse is going up. The drugs are getting more potent. The drugs are getting more strange and, and more readily available. Um, you know, for example, that's just, just an example, right? So, yeah, I mean, we need, we need mental health education twofold in our, in our, in our public school system at least because that's supposed to be in our control somewhat what private schools do is another matter um but yeah i was fortunate to have a school where for example um i had an anxiety disorder it was diagnosed everybody at the school was aware when i say everybody i mean my teachers the principal key decision makers my doctor we had a school-based mental health program which allowed a family practitioner to be on site so she could actually tend to acute mental health issues and she was able to diagnose and prescribe medication on the campus Mm. okay now the federal government has since disbanded school-based mental health as a program okay there is no more school-based mental health and and where it is it's 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 it used to be a countrywide pilot now it's gone so i think we bring that back first of all let's just bring back school-based mental health because it saved my life I know other people whose lives it saved that went to my high school personally. Um, that's something that we could bring back. I don't even think the fun, I mean, you know, we lost $6.5 trillion in the Department of Defense budget in 2015. I think we could spare a, a couple hundred million for school-based mental health, okay? So let's bring that back. Um, and, and how that played out for me was like, you know, my doctor just told people, listen, uh, teachers, Listen, the guy has anxiety. Sometimes it's going to be hard for him to just sit there for extended periods of time. Class is an hour and a half. If he needs to get up and go, don't make him have to raise his hand and ask you like a little kid, right? Don't tell him he can't, right? If he needs to go get something to drink, sometimes anxiety makes your, you know, make your blood sugar run low or you'll be faint or, you know, you just need some water. You need some cold, you know, water on your face to try and clear your head. Just, just let people move about in good faith, not that they're trying to trick the system, right? Mm -hmm. And so it was a very simple thing that allowed my GPA to go up to like 3.4. Wow. Right? I was, remember I said I was a 2.0 student. We implemented that system. I went up to a 3.4. Wow. And and, And the same thing happened in college. College is a little different setting, but the same basic considerations and communication about mental health I was the I was a B role. I was a B a student in, in college as well, 3.4, 3.5. So, you know, it, it actually works. And I don't even think there's any argument about whether it works. I think our argument is always about who's gonna pay for it. So now just to bring it home to Chicago, you know, lately we've uh, I don't know if you know, but there's been a lot of murders happening here in Chicago. I think we're above 
400 murders already uh, in a year, you know, thus far. And it's rising, it's not slowing down. We got some guys really dealing with uh, anxiety, PTSD. I mean, you, I mean, like you can roll out <laughs> all, the, all the diagnose, you know, uh, di diagnose mental health uh, disorders with participants we have and guys that are not in the system and not in our specific realm of helping them out yet. And as a you can you can see some of the rappers today in Chicago being. You know, you can see mental health playing out with them. They're, they're like laughing at other other people being killed and, and uh, talking about them, making songs about them specifically and saying things that you wouldn't imagine that someone was talking about a person being murdered. You can, you can only say that there's some kind of disconnect or mental health disorder going on right there. Like that, that like they're traumatized in a way and they're trying to react off of that trauma in a way of like combating it and saying disrespectful things like that's going to be the part that'll make up for whatever they might be lacking. Have, do you know anything about that or is that new for you? No, I mean, look, the Twin Cities is an extension of Chicago, right? We're, right. 100%, right? And, and so rest in peace to, 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 my, to, to the brother Vo Mack, who was just murdered recently. Right. Uh, I, I think he, he was out in the gardens. He was murdered. Um, and so, you know, I have family and friends who have been back and forth to Chicago to, to support his family during this time. So, you know, it, you know, the Midwest connection is the crime in Chicago is touching everybody in the Midwest. Right. And, you know, I, I think, you know, for us as, as black men, we really got to start to to think about things on two tiers okay who are our leaders where first first and foremost where did they go okay who were they who were they where did they go and why did they go okay and then who's left and who is it that's actually involved in this black on black crime it's 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 a lot of young people very very young you know young people um not always but there are a lot of young people involved and and, you know, when I look out, especially when it comes to the rap thing and I just look at the scene, it's like, like there's a there seems to be a culture where people actually think that killing somebody is cool. Right. Mm -hmm. There's a coolness aspect to it. Right. There, there's a you know, because it's one of the easiest things you could do when you really when you really get down to it. When you really get to the bottom of it, killing another man is one of the easiest things to do. And we've made it exceptionally easy when you've added in guns. When you had to, when you used to have to beat somebody with their, your bare hands, that wasn't so easy. And so the murders weren't the same at the same rate, right? So that's the biggest argument, I think, for the gun talk, the, you know, the gun control talk and the right wing who says black on black crime. Well, it's guns that are a primary issue and how easy it is for black people to kill people, right? And it's, it's just extremely easy to kill another man with a gun in your hand. Um, and, and the fact that it, it, it's, it's gives you a, a level of credibility, it gives you a level of, of respect, not really respect, but fear, but at least a, a cool point, you know, that's something that we got to start to really figure out as black men, not have somebody else tell us that it's not cool or have somebody else try and reason with us that that's not cool. We have to really just decide Yo, it's not really cool to kill somebody. Like, there's nothing really cool about that. Um, especially after you watch the George Floyd video. See, to me, it's like, because we had the same issue pop off in Minneapolis after George Floyd. You had coronavirus, people in their house, the summer hits, you had George Floyd, people took to the streets, set a blaze, and then the murder rate shot up. People were shooting each other every other day. And to me, it's just like, man, if you're a black man and you just watch a black man get killed by a cop and you go out and shoot another black man, I, I don't know. I don't like you. I don't think you're cool. You couldn't hang with me. Right. And I think we got to bring that level of accountability to each other and just say, like, yo, man, that's that's actually like that's that's a sucker move. Like we are in a real fight against a very powerful opponent where none of our lives mean much you know they may mean something but they don't mean much and and so we have to have a mean more to each other right 
Um, now, how you get that message to a, a young group of people who don't have much to begin with, now that's the trick, right? And I think we also have to be very serious as older Black people in the community who aren't involved in Black on Black crime. Because let's be, let's be honest, right, Ali? We, we know that we know that the reality is there's only a few shooters around, right, that are doing the majority of it. That's the way it is with everything. What the majority of, of something extreme is being done by a minority of people, right? There are way more black people in the community that are not involved with gang violence and not murdering people on a daily basis. Okay, so we have to figure out what is it that we can do to actually start to address this issue beyond just saying, man, you know, messed up another guy got killed today and it was another black person and man that was you know here we go again it's like no who are our leaders what are you doing are you going to vote when the when the when the politicians that promise that they're going to go in and change these things and give these young people other things to look to don't do what they promise are you actually taken to the streets or are you waiting till the next election to try and vote them out that was my message to minneapolis the free people of this country are gonna become their own entity. If you roll with black men and you rolling with us, I'm cool with that. But black men, we're not gonna wait for these politicians to run for election again, to hold them accountable for not keeping their promises because we die every day. And whether you say we die by the cops or we die by our own hand, we die every day. So at the point where somebody gets killed and you haven't upheld your promise, we'll take them to the streets. We're taking to the streets, we take into your house, we take and, and we're gonna and we're gonna sit there and we're gonna occupy space. And we're so I would I would I would encourage young black men who have that capacity to be violent to be aggressive to be you know out there and active like that in the streets man you could we need y'all like we need y'all if you turn that positive you we actually could change this thing we yeah. actually could change this thing you know what i mean like that's that's my message to them is you know, some people, some people are that way. They can't change who they are. And yeah, they've had trauma and mental health and all of that plays a role. I have too. But I'm, I'm using that and gearing that towards let's fight to make this thing better and killing another man out in the street. That ain't going to cut it. We got a, a last question because I know, thank you for your time, but one more question from the brother Daryl. Did you ever have to carry a gun to get approached by gangs uh, through, through your time uh, growing up? They don't know you used to be a Okay, I ain't gonna say that, but go ahead. Yeah, I mean, you know, I grew up in the street, man. You know, right. I'm fortunate. I'm fortunate to be where I am. You know what I mean? I'm fortunate to be able to use my experience and, and the things that I've been able to accomplish to be a positive impact. Um, again, look, my thing is about honesty, right? So, and being honest, you know, I can't, I'm very, very connected to Chicago. Let's just say it like that. Right. You know what I mean? And, and I'm not ashamed of that. And, right. and like I told the young brothers when I was there visiting with you guys, you know, there was there was an old head that that's very well respected, that's that's very high up, that saved my life, who told me don't go further into this because of because you, you're destined for something bigger. You're destined for something better. You know, you could be another me, but do we need another me? Right. And I'm looking at him like to this day, I got so much love for him because it's like, man. We didn't need another him. <laughs> we need we need what I'm doing right now, right? So, um, yes and yes, yes and yes. Gangs yes approached yes. me. No, I, they didn't. They didn't really approach me. You know, I, I kind of grew up in it. And uh, you know, as far as as carrying a gun, no, I never needed that. I'm six eight. I'm you know I'm I'm six eight and I'm pretty good with my hands. You know, so that part I didn't need to do. But but um, you know, I've definitely been around them. You know, and and that's you know that's something that. That comes with where we grow up from, and and I'm and I'm okay with that. Man, I want to tell you, uh, man. Once again, one when you cut when when this thing clear, and you hey, come back through Chicago like you do, man. Please stop by, and talk to our guys. We we rotate them in and out. So, man, it'd be another fresh set of guys hearing your words again. But believe me, you you are encouraging, you are inspiring uh, to me, other staff, and I guarantee some of the participants heard your voice. Man, uh, Arnie Duncan, you, you know how you take it away, man. Go and put the icing on the cake. No, I have nothing to add. Just, again, just appreciate you so much taking the time and being so so honest. And it's, it's like, 
unbelievable lesson. <laughs> it's like going, going to school and hearing from a PhD. So really, really appreciate it. I uh, keep leading, as Ali said, anytime you're in town, we'd love to have you come spend some time with guys. We really, really appreciate that. And we're thinking about taking a trip to Minneapolis, you know, when the pandemic settles down. If we were to do that, we'd try and, try and come find you and continue to learn from, from uh, not just your words, but the example you set every day. So thank you so much. Thank you, guys, man. I appreciate it, man. I, I enjoy my time down there. When I get through Chicago, I'm always, always coming to see you guys, man. I appreciate appreciate the time. Let me tell my story, so. Yes, sir. And when we do come up there, man, we definitely connect it, man. 100%. Hey, thanks, brothers. Y'all have a great day next week. Same time. Well, it'll be Thursday, man. Y'all tune in Thursday, 3 to 4, man. Love.